Well, hi there. So in this video, we're going to switch to the open economy part of this unit. And open economy just means international trade. So it's, it's another example of econ making a fancy name for something. Um, so in this part, we're going to learn about basically how do we keep track when, com when countries trade with each other. Um, and so it's kind of explaining how we view it when countries trade with each other and, and when they trade goods and services or when people move from one country to another and they, they work in other countries, or how do we keep track when people decide to like buy and sell stocks, bonds, real estate, stuff like that, and it's all international. So um, to start us off, kind of a review of what, what we sometimes call the, the circular flow model, right? But this is, this is the global circular flow model. So we know that like you've got a circular flow model where you know, you've got households and they interact with firms and you've got a factor market and a product market. And, and if you don't remember that, that, that that's, you know, it's kind of like econ level one is, is to say there's a factor market where the resources are bought and sold and there's a product market where the goods and services are bought and sold. And households, their money flows from the factor market because that's where they get their money is when they're paid and they flow to the product market where they buy stuff. And then that money in the product market goes to a firm and it flows to the firm and the firm takes that money and puts it into the factor market and they pay their workers. And so we call it a circular flow because that money is flowing through it. And we looked at that one in unit six. Now, in the big picture, there's also a global kind of circular flow. And so if we have like domestic households and firms, they're going to put their money towards the global product and factor markets. And then they, that money then goes to global households and firms and it gets exchanged in the global financial market and then comes back to domestic households and firms. So this is a much more kind of complex movement of money. Um, but, but in short, right, thinking about it this way is that money kind of flows, flows out. And so this is kind of the way the U.S. one works, right, um, is out of U.S., as Americans, right? Americans and like Americans buy foreign stuff, okay? So the money flows out and um, that, that we kind of buy goods and services and when we pay foreign workers, right? So that's, that's kind of money flowing out and that money flows to this kind of global product and factor market where it ends up in the pockets of foreign households and foreign firms. But those dollars don't just accumulate, accumulate, accumulate in those other countries. Those dollars flow, right, flow, and maybe this would be better actually to put it right here. They go into what's called the global financial market. And those dollars flow back to the U.S., right? Um, it flows back, those same dollars, they flow back into the U.S. as foreigners, right, people living in other countries, buy U.S. assets, right? U.S. assets, and that's stocks, um, bonds, and real estate. And so oftentimes students are like, is it a bad thing? And this is a, kind of a simplistic question of it, but is it a bad thing that all Americans seem to do is import, 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 right? All we do is we buy stuff from China and Japan and Germany, and the money that we spend flows out to those other countries. And it's like, OMG, is that a bad thing? And most economists would be like, eh, because those dollars flow out. They go to Germany, they go to Japan, they go to Korea, they go to China. And then they flow right back in to the United States as the Germans, the Koreans, the Chinese, the Japanese, and so forth. They buy American stuff. They go, we're going to buy some of your stocks. We want to buy a little bit of Apple. We want to buy a U.S. government bond. Let's loan the U.S. government some money. Or let's buy a penthouse in New York City. So those dollars flow right back into the United States. And so it's not like, you know, we're, we're, we're in danger of running out of money or something. It's not, it's not how this works, right? The money flows in and then flows out and back again. So, um, so the, the kind of terminology here are inflows and outflows and kind of a brief word about it. An inflow is money that's flowing in, hence the name, to a country. And it's in exchange for goods or assets or services that are going to flow out, right? But we don't call those outflows because we don't care about the stuff. We care about the money. So all the terminology here refers to the money, the flow of the money. And so if it's an inflow, it means money's flowing in and stuff is flowing out. If it's an outflow, right? So this would be an outflow, outflow. That means money is flowing out 
And in exchange, that country is getting goods, assets, services. And every single dollar, right, that flows out, that flows out has to get balanced by a dollar that flows back in. It's it's mathematically a truism because literally, like as an American, if I go over to China and I buy a huge bunch of steel, right, a million dollars worth of steel, well, this Chinese guy, now he's got a million dollars, like actual U.S. dollars. And he goes, what do I do with this? Uh, stick it in my pocket. Okay, that's an asset. A U.S. dollar is an asset. But he's highly unlikely to stick it in his pocket. He's going to put it into stocks. He's going to put it into bonds. He's going to put it into real estate, American real estate, because you can't use the dollar anywhere else. you got to go to America with it, right? Um, and, and even if he doesn't do it, those dollars are going to end up in the hands of somebody who will do something with it that are going to take it back to the United States and they're going to buy um, stocks, bonds, and real estate with it. So there's a balance, a flow here that occurs. And every single dollar is always balanced. So some examples of this, right, is listed down below. If the U.S. buys goods from China, it counts as an inflow of money to China and an outflow for the United States. And don't, don't worry about this current account, financial account stuff just yet. But basically, it's just the idea of a, if a Haitian woman is in the United States and she's working in the United States and she sends money to Haiti, well, that's an inflow for Haiti and an outflow for the United States. The Japanese guy, he buys some American stocks. That counts as an outflow from Japan because the money's flowing out and an inflow for the United States. So it's actually kind of double counted on both sides in the sense that it's an outflow for one, it's an inflow for the other. All right, now let's kind of go a little bit deeper in, in, in this question of like, how do we categorize inflows and outflows? And this is really just more like, how do countries keep track of this information? Um, they keep track of basically international transactions. And we call these the balance of payments. And there's two basic accounts that countries keep track of. And it's not like an actual bank account. So don't, don't think that it's like, you know, that the U.S. government has a, has a financial bank account. It's not, that's not what this is. It's more like an accounting measure. So it's a way for us to just keep track. Um, and both sides have to balance each other. So it's actually similar to a bank balance sheet in that way. But, but that's basically where the similarities stop. So the, on one side is what we call the current account. And on the other side is what we call the financial account. Now, what I often tell students is, is that like, basically, if you know one, then you know that, that like, if you're given a list of things that, that are like, where does it fit? Does it fit into the current account or does it fit into the financial account? Well, if you remember like all the things that go into the current account and you get something and there's like something in the list and you're like, what the heck is that? It, then it goes in the financial account, right? Like, or if you remember the stuff that's in the financial account, then, and it's not in there and you're like, what is that? Then it must go in the other one. So, so we'll kind of walk through what goes into both sides of this account. Um, and it'll kind of hopefully start to make clear like what's going on with this inflow outflow stuff. So I'm gonna start with the current account. And the current account is actually really kind of talking about stuff that is current in terms of a flow of, of income or of stuff is really what it is. So it's, it's like income or stuff. Um, and so when we say stuff, we're talking about net sales and purchases of goods and services. That's net exports. And if we're actually just talking about stuff, the physical stuff, it's called the balance of trade, the trade balance. And so the United States, right, has a what we call trade deficit because the United States imports, <clears throat> excuse me, imports lots and lots of stuff. Sorry. <coughs> Hang on. Got to get a drink of water. Got to pause. Whew, that's what I get for eating a granola bar right before doing a video. Oh, boy. Um, so what I was saying was, is that this is what we call the trade deficit if this balance of trade is negative. Um, but it's not the whole picture, right? The whole picture is not just that. The U.S. does have a negative current account balance, but it's balanced by a positive financial account balance, right? Because remember, inflow, outflow. Every dollar that flows out has to flow back in. The other elements that are in the current account, in addition to goods and services, are factor income. And this is kind of confusing for some students, but it's income earned by all the different kinds of factors. So labor and companies, we would consider those to be kind of similar regarded. If you have income that you're getting from those, like wages, profits, or dividends from stocks, that counts as income. So that would count if it's an international transaction. So case in point, right? Like I, Daniel Glassinger, own a share of Microsoft. It's an American company. I'm an American person. So therefore it has nothing to do with this balance of payments accounts, nothing, because there's no international transaction. However, 
if a Japanese woman owned the share of Microsoft and Microsoft paid out their 50 cent dividend. And they said, here you go, Japanese woman, here's your 50 cent share of our, of our profits. That would count. And it would count here as factor income. And it would be an inflow for Japan, 50 cents, and an outflow from the United States of 50 cents. So for us, like if we looked at the US, right? So if this was the USA, then it would be like minus 50 cents from that because the money flowed out. Note here is not buying and selling the actual stock. That's a totally separate thing. This is just the income. Another one would be income earned by assets. So like rents and interest. So this is really, when you think about it, another way to think about it would be the income approach to GDP is wages, rent, income, or sorry, interest and profit. And so wages, rent, interest and profit, all of those things, if you have international flows of those, they count as net factor income. Again, it's not actually the changing value of the property. It's not buying and selling the property. It's not buying and selling the bond. It's the income from it. That's the big distinction here. The last one here is net transfers. And this is just the idea of, of sometimes foreign nationals will send remittances back home to family. That was an example a moment ago of a Haitian woman sending money to family. Foreign aid also counts here. So if we donate it as a country, if we donate money to Haiti or something, that counts as flowing money out from the United States on the current account. So as I said, the United States, our current account balance is negative. But our financial account balance is positive and it's an equal balance because every dollar that flowed out on this side is going to flow back into the United States in one of three ways. First is there are cash and deposit accounts. And basically, if foreigners are holding on to dollars, that actually counts as a financial asset, right? Money is a financial asset. And so if foreigners are just holding on to dollars, that counts as basically them flowing it back over to the financial account. I know that that kind of sounds like like econ sleight of hand, but it because it kind of is, but but at the end of the day, it also is that the dollars, if they're holding on to them, those are a financial asset. If they buy government bonds, those are also a financial asset. So any kind of bond really counts here. But let's say that Japanese woman takes her 50 cents and buys a US treasury bond with it, right? A 50 cent treasury bond. That doesn't exist. But let's say she did, then that money is flowing back into the United States. And she's saying, here, United States, take my 50 cents back. And she gets to keep the bond, right? And then that kind of thing. Um, but, but the US gets to keep 50 cents. Likewise, if she bought more stocks, more bonds, or if she bought American real estate, it would flow back in. And so the United States has lots of our dollars flowing back in to our stock market, for example. Lots of international investors put their money into US stocks. And that's a good thing for us. That's them investing in our companies, which allows our companies to grow and do cool stuff, right? We, we get all kinds of cool stuff from that. Um, when they lend us their money, when we say, um, when they say, here you go, take our money, we'd like to lend you money, that helps us, right? That helps us in, in many ways. When they buy our real estate, I know that there's been a lot of controversy about, well, you know, the Chinese, they're buying a, um, American farmland. Well, that's not a bad thing. What it actually does is it puts those dollars back into the United States. And those Chinese farms, well, they're here in America. And so we're still producing grain and wheat and all kinds of other stuff, sorry, wheat. And we're, when we're doing some really cool stuff, um, so it kind of doesn't matter. From the econ perspective of it, we go like, nah, it's a wash. It's all a circular flow of money in this regard. Um, certainly, you can kind of nitpick that argument of saying, well, this matters and that one matters. But in the econ sense of like, are we worried about the money flowing out or something? We don't really concern ourselves with a country having a massive trade deficit or something. It, it just goes, well, we have a comparative advantage in doing something else. So at any rate, right, the big picture takeaway is, is you got to know how stuff, right? how stuff uh, is categorized. So that's an important one, categorized. So you're gonna get stuff where it'll say like, where does it fit? Is it on the current account or the financial account? And you just gotta know like it fits here, if it's there. Um, and you have to know they balance, right? They balance. So every dollar that flows out on one side is gonna flow back in on the other side. We're gonna do some cool connections to things we've already learned as well with this um, that we'll see in the coming problem sets. But I hope this helped you. See you next time.